songs like this. It's not to hype you up. It's not to create an atmosphere. It's a chance just to cast off every weight. It's a, a chance just to unload from the junk of this world. How many know all week long we're bombarded by the things of this world that they attack our mind maybe with fear and anxiety, with the cares of life? But you know what? We can be free this morning. How many know that you are free in Jesus? But sometimes you just got to shake it off. Come on, shake it off this morning. Speak over that circumstance. I am free. I'm not bound by you.
triumphant. The church of the living God is about to march through with light shining. The church of the living God is about to march through with words of wisdom and demonstrations of the power of the Holy Spirit. The church of the living God is about to show itself true and triumphant on the earth. The church of the living God is not going to be segregated, secluded, isolated, and disbanded. But the church of the living God is going to be together, unified, walking together, speaking the same language, going in the same direction, declaring the same gospel to the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, the enemy wants to shut us down. The enemy wants to make us be quiet. The enemy wants us just to get secluded from our four and no more. But the Spirit of the Lord says, let whosoever will come. Let whosoever will be drawn. Let the, let the Spirit of God draw them in. Just like the Spirit of the Lord drew that prodigal son out of the pig pen. Just like the Spirit of the Lord drew the prodigal son back to the Father. God, this Dispatch your spirit this morning and draw those wayward ones back into the family. Draw those wayward sons back into the family. Draw those wayward daughters back into the family. Draw those families back into the family. Draw those singles back into the family. Draw those elementary kids back into the family. Draw those, those high school kids and college kids. Draw them back into the family because here, this is the time and this is the moment and this is season where the church can be unified, can be strengthened, can be equipped, and can be empowered for the assignment that we are about to be launched out in for the glory of God. Can anybody agree with this bald-headed preacher this morning and say amen? Whoa! Say amen. Oh, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Hallelujah. Mm. 
I want you to go with me in your Bible to the book of Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. While you're finding yourself there in the Gospel of Luke, let me just encourage you. Those of you that have children, you realize that today is the fifth Sunday, and so we're not having children's church upstairs this morning, so our kids will be in here with us today. And let me encourage you while you're turning to Luke chapter 18, that the offering baskets on the platform to my left and to my right. Feel free to deposit the tithe of the offering any time that God moves upon you. If you want to, you can put it in the depository out in the foyer on the wall, our receptacle out there. If you want to give it remote. Hopefully give it digitally. I want you to do that this morning. I want you to be blessed. I want God to be honored. I want the, the family of God to be strengthened. I want the word of God to be proclaimed and the will of God to be accomplished. Not only here in Camp Hill, but in the areas around the world that we support through the giving that you bring to the treasury here locally. May God reach out and do things globally. All for the advancement of his kingdom and all for his glory. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray this morning. Amen, amen, and amen. Luke. Chapter 18, verse 1 through verse number 8 is the assignment today. This is what God says in His Word. We're going to hear how it's going to apply to your life and my life today. The Bible says, give reference to the reading of the Word of the Lord. It says, then He spoke, referring to Jesus, He spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Say, there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a certain, uh, there was a widow in that city and she came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, though I do not fear God nor regard man, Yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual cunning she weary me. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said, and shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Here is the focus part of the sermon this morning. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will He really find faith on the earth? When the Son of Man comes, will He really find faith on the earth? I want to talk to us this morning about this thought that God dropped into my heart in a conversation with Pastor Michelle earlier this week. One simple word, infused. I want to talk to us this morning about being infused. I want to talk to us today about what it means to be infused and what we may be possibly allowing ourselves to be infused with. Master, I want you to hide me now behind the bloodstained banner of the cross of Calvary. God, I want the words that we speak, God, let them not be my words. Let them not be my understanding. Let it not be my wisdom. Let it not be my will. Let it not be my way. But God, may your word be spoken. May your word be heard. God, may your wisdom be sent. May your wisdom be received. God, may your will be, be exposed. And may your will walk out in the lives of your church. And God, may you receive all of the glory. And we will give you all of the praise for the outcome of not only this day, but the days to come. I ask it now in the name of Jesus Christ. Settle down around us, Lord. Hold us in your hand. Draw us close to your heart. Speak to us in our spirit. Infuse us. Infuse us with all of the things of heaven. Infuse us with all of the goodness of who you are. Infuse us with your glory. In Jesus' name, I give you praise in advance. Amen, amen, and amen again. Infused. We, my friends, are living in an uncertain day today. 
We, my friends, are living in a troubling day today. Preacher, you didn't have to tell us that. We've been watching Foxy News and CNN and ABC and NBC and CBS and whoever else you get your and you digest your, your, your content of news from. We know what you're saying. We, we see it on the airways. But I want to tell you something this morning, church, that what we see on the airways going on right now in our nation and in nations around the world, I want you to understand that those are just the beginning, the Bible says, those are just the beginning of sorrows that the church is going to face. Those are just the beginning of sorrows that mankind is going to be going through. Those are just the beginnings of the unfolding of the eschatology of the book of Revelation that you and I are going to find ourselves living through in the days that you and I occupy space and time in this earth. I want to tell you, don't get your eyes fixed on what the Foxy News and the CNN News and all these other news outreaches are trying to get you to focus your attention on. Don't you let them stick that deadly needle in you and infuse you with something that's going to kill you, something that's going to rob you of your joy and zap you of the strength of the Holy Ghost. Don't you let them stick that negative needle inside of you and pump you full of all the darkness and all the wickedness of this world. Don't you let them, don't you submit yourself and let them inject you with all their poisons. Don't you allow them to stick that in you. You are better than that. God did not create you to be infused with those things. We are living in a day much like what Jesus told his disciples in the gospel of Luke chapter 18. I read the scripture and I said, my Lord in heaven, this is so apropos to where we are living today. Preacher, can you tell us what you are talking about? Absolutely. I'm glad you asked. Let me unpack it for you this morning. The Bible says, Jesus says, my Bible, which is the New King James Version, these words are in red, which means Jesus is speaking to his disciples and Jesus is talking to us. My Bible says these words. I will lay the foundation and then just unload the sermon on you this morning. If you're ready, say amen. Come on, let's digest, let's just envelop, let's just be enveloped by what God's got in store. I feel the preaching spirit on me this morning strong. I feel the preaching spirit stirring up inside of me like fire shut up in my bones this morning. I feel the, the fire of heaven. I feel the burning and the stirring of the Holy Spirit. I feel like God's getting ready to open up the windows of heaven and he's about to download in you and download in me and download in his church. I believe he's about to restructure the DNA of the church that he gave birth to because he understands better than we understand the day that we are living and realizing that he doesn't need to have an anemic church. He don't need to have a windy church. He don't need to have a jelly belly church. He don't need to have a yellow spine church. He needs a church that's going to stand firm and stand true to what his word says in the earth. Oh, Ooh, Jesus, help me preach this morning, God. The Bible says, Jesus says, talking about this parable in the scripture, that there was a certain city, didn't give the city a name, just said it was a certain city. Could be Camp Hill, Pennsylvania, for all we know. Could be Harrisburg, who knows? Could be Washington, D.C., who knows? Could be Columbia, South Carolina, could be Nashville, Tennessee, could be Temple, Florida. It doesn't say, it just says there was a certain city. The Bible says in that certain city was a judge woo, who did not fear God nor did he regard man. This judge represents a person who is in the seat of authority. The judge represents someone that is occupying a space that would reflect the authority of the land in which that person was sent to occupy that space. The Bible says he did not fear God, nor did he regard man. This guy was messed up from the neck up. In other words, he wasn't, he wasn't worried about what God was doing. He had no fault for God. He gave no, no, no enlightenment to God. He got no understanding from God. He didn't desire to even know God. And he really didn't care what those around him thought. He didn't fear God, nor did he regard man. He didn't care what those in the neighborhood thought of him. He didn't care what those down the way thought of him. He wasn't worried about what their opinion of him was. Why? Because he was a, a wicked and a crazy judge. Uh, no no respect for God and no care for others this man was. The Bible says that there was a widow in that city. Doesn't give her a name. Just identifies her status in life. She was a widow. That means that her husband was no longer alive. That means 
that she had no one to take care of her. In those days, if your husband died and you had no sons, you were in trouble. Hello, somebody. There was a certain widow in that city that was ruled by that wicked judge. And she came to him and she said, get justice for me from my adversary. And the Bible says he would not for a while or for a season, he would not get help for her. But afterward, he said to himself, in other words, he finally come to his senses some kind of way or another and, and, and said, though I don't fear God nor regard man because this woman is always knocking on my door. Because this woman is always asking the same question. Because this woman is always ringing up my cell phone line. Because this woman is sending me text message after text message. Because this woman has found me on Instagram and Snapchat and Facebook and LinkedIn and all these Twitter. She's tweeting the day outside of me. Because this woman is persistent in her request and she's beginning to wear me down and wear she said, because of her continual coming, she's going to break me out. So I'm going to give her some assistance. Because of the persistence of her petition. Because she didn't just ask one time and quit. She didn't just knock one time and go back home. She didn't just seek for help one moment and then turn around and go back into her wicked world that was ruled by an unjust judge. But by her continual coming, uh, you're getting the picture this morning. Because of her continual prayers, because of her continual asking, because of her continual petition, because she didn't give up one time and she keeps coming back. And sometimes it may be multiple times a day and multiple times a week and multiple times a month. Because she will not give up, because she will not stop, because she keeps coming and she keeps wearing down. She keeps wearing on me and she keeps asking of me, I'm going to have to help her out, this judge said to himself. Then hear what the unjust judge said. Shall God not avenge his own? This unjust judge that had no fear of God, no regard for man, makes that statement. Shall God not avenge his own? Who cry out to him. Listen. Who cry out to him day and night. Shall God not avenge his own? Who don't give up, who don't give in, who don't quit, who don't ask one time, who don't just petition one time, but those that keep coming and keep coming like the Energizer Bunny with prayer, like the Energizer Bunny never stopping, like the Energizer Bunny always going, always going, always going. God save my son. God save my daughter. God uh, straighten out my life. God help my marriage. God touch my finances. God touch my body. Bring healing to my body. I'm talking about those kind of prayers uh, that come before the throne of heaven on a continual basis that are never giving up. Uh, they're always petitioning God. Have you prayed for something long enough uh, that you finally heard God say, I've heard you pray. You don't have to pray anymore. Now that's between me and that person. Or now that's between me and that illness. Or now that's between me and that need. I don't need you to pray anymore. I've heard your praise. You've cried out to me day and night. Have you ever prayed so fervently? Have you ever prayed so deeply? Have you ever prayed so persistently that you felt the release of heaven? That's okay. God has got it on his radar. He's going to take care of this. I can go on to my next item on my prayer list. Because of that kind of persistence, this woman was wearing him down. And the unjust judge says, will God not let those who come to him in the same manner who cry out to him day and night? He'll hear them. He will avenge them, though he may take a little while in doing it. It may be that we don't give our order today and we'll receive our order at the pickup window tomorrow. Hello, somebody. It may be that you don't make your request this morning and you get home and it's waiting on you like Amazon. <laughs> that package you've been waiting for finally shows up. Sometimes when you ask God, sometimes when you seek after God, sometimes when you petition from God, sometimes God takes His time. Not that He's not answering you. He's just taking His time. He's just letting you continue to ask. He's letting you continue to seek. He's letting you continue to knock until He avenges you, until He shows up. He says, He goes on and says, I tell you that He will avenge them speedily, quickly He will avenge them. 
This is where I want to go this morning. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Will he really find that kind of persistence on the earth? Will he find that kind of consistency on the earth? Will he really find that kind of faith in his church? Will he really find that kind of faith in his sons? Will he really find that kind of faith in his daughter? Will he really find that kind of faith in his bride? When he comes, will he really find faith on the earth? You know, we're living in a time, and I usually don't say much about what goes on in the world around us, but I realize that we've experienced some very heartbreaking news this last couple of this last couple of weeks and we've experienced some difficulty here on our nation's land and we're experiencing the difficulty of those that are connected to us on, on lands that are across the across the ponds for quite a ways. We see the headlines breaking. We see what is being reported. Pastor Michelle and I were having a conversation this last week and we were talking about some of the stuff that the, 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 the news agencies are reporting. And I got emotional because I realized that not long ago my son was in that same area doing the very same thing that our military sons and daughters are doing today. He gave 13 months of his life over there to make sure that that area was kept free and that we could embrace the freedoms in our nation. And then you get the report that there's been this devastating attack that has taken the lives of 13 of our military sons and daughters. The first question you have to ask yourself is this. Why? Why? Why did that happen? Why did that take place? Why were they allowed to be in that, in that station, in that season, in that city? Why? Did that happen? Why did these 13 young men and young women, why did their lives have to end? And I don't think it's irresponsible to ask the question why when you're asking the question to gain understanding from his perspective and not answers for your own selfishness. Why? Then the next question you ask yourself is what is the purpose of all this? What is the purpose in the events that are taking place. What is the purpose in what's transpiring? What is the purpose of what's going on? Again, I don't think it's against God to ask that question. What is the purpose? Lord, what are you doing? What are you doing? Not that you are doing this. Not that you are causing this. But God, what are you allowing this to happen? What is the purpose of your allowance of what we see in our news feeds today? Again, I don't think it's wrong to ask those questions of God so long as we're asking it from the perspective of His purpose and not for our own selfishness. We're talking this week and I got to ask him myself and I asked Pastor Michelle, I said, could it possibly be that the why and what God is doing and what God is allowing, could it possibly be that He is allowing these things to happen in the earth today so that his church would have an opportunity or have a platform that his church would be illuminated with wisdom so that his church would understand that it's their responsibility to take their stage in this time in the history. And it's time for his church not to, not to slink back into, in, in, into just a social club, but it's time for his church to rise up to the level of commitment that these days are in need of. Could it be? Could I present to us this morning that it could be that the reason those things are taking place is because God is searching to and fro on the earth and he's looking to see what his church is going to do. How is his church going to behave? What is going to be the church's response? Not the government's response. Not the wickedness out of Washington response. He wasn't worried about this unjust judge. He's had his eyes on this little woman that was in the land. I want to tell you something. He's not concerned about what goes on at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue as much as he's concerned about what goes on in the church at the address that you live at and that I live at. What is my church going to do? What's going to be their response? What are we going to do in a time like this? How are we going to be in a time like this? Are we going to let our faith fall to the floor? Are we going to let our faith just stop being faith? Are we going to look for a room to isolate ourselves in? Are we going to look for a room that we can shut the door and just come over here and just we're going to see kumbaya and we're not going to be worried about what's going on in the world around us? I'm going to tell you something, my friends. God did not send Jesus. 
Jesus Christ to create the church to give you and I life so that we can hide ourselves away. No, no, no. He gave his son, Jesus Christ, so that you and I can be infused with his light, so that we can be infused with his love, so that we can be infused with his truth, so that he can take us in this time and put us right smack dab in the middle of darkness. I was quiet in here this morning. Y'all was singing praises a long ago. Y'all was dancing around. I saw you. It's got quiet in here today. Infused. I believe the church is being infused these days. I'm just concerned about what the church is being infused with. I'm going to preach it whether you want to hear it or not. Don't turn me off Facebook. Don't turn me off YouTube. Don't turn me off you streaming uh, service. Let me stay on the airways as long as I possibly can. I heard a prayer this morning that said, God, let the pastor have the words of wisdom that's going to reach out into the far-flung areas of the world. Let it go way beyond where we are right here. Mm. I'm concerned about what the church is being infused with, what's being released into her. The question of the morning is this, what does it mean to be infused? Why would this little woman keep coming to this judge? Why would this little woman keep knocking on the door? Why would this little woman not give up her request? Why would she, would she not stay home and just, and just uh, receive what the area around her would tell her she would have to receive? Why did she keep going? What is the church being infused with today? I got thinking about that word infused, and I wanted to understand a little bit about what that means. And this is what to be infused literally means. It means to teach and impress by frequent repetition. To teach and impress by frequent repetition. In other words, it's not just a one and done thing. It's not just a, you hear it one time, you got it, okay, it's in your bank, now you can keep on right going. No, sometimes to be infused means you've got to be exposed to it on more than one occasion, exposed on a consistent manner, exposed at more than one juncture so that you can be impressed by what is being infused into you. It's not just a single dose. It's a frequent repetition. You know, it happens continually. It's almost like a steady, you know, let me just say it this way. We took some guys out on a canoe trip yesterday because somebody told us it would be fun to go up and drive or float down the Susquehanna for eight miles. It would be fun, they said. Come on, let's go on this canoe trip. Bring your sunscreen, pack your lunch if you want to. They'll provide you with the, with the canoe. They'll provide you with the life preserver. They'll give you the, the packs. The, you just get out there and we're just going to float down the Susquehanna. We're going to have a good time. That good time lasted all of about 30 minutes. <laughs> we got into the canoe. We floated out into the beginning of our journey, and it was nice and pleasant. The trees were on the side of us, and we were watching bald eagles fly around. I said, are you sure that's a bald eagle? And one, one guy said, yeah, that's a bald eagle. I said, are you sure that eagle had hair on his head? <laughs> we were out there about 30 minutes, and... Some of us began eating on our snacks or eating our lunch while the other was doing a little paddle. We just floated a little bit. About 30 minutes of the trip was great. We went under one of the overpass. We got out into the broader part of the Susquehanna. And all of a sudden, the headwinds hit us. And there was no floating down the Susquehanna anymore. If you didn't paddle, you weren't going down that river. Should have took us about three hours. And I told the guy I was in the boat with, I said, if we don't paddle, we're going to be in there for eight hours. It's going to take us that long to get down this river. And we had some partners in boats ahead of us. They were way ahead of us. And I thought, man, they got to have motors on those boats because they, they were way out there. Me and my partner, we steady paddling. That wind was steady blowing. I want to tell you something. If we just stopped and stopped rowing and stopped paddling and said, we're just going to sit in this, in this canoe and we're just going to let the river take us down to where it wants to take us, we probably would still be out by the Susquehanna. <laughs> That's how bad the wind was blowing. We had to continuously put that oar or put that paddle in the water. It wasn't, we didn't paddle just one time and we, were, we, had, to keep, we had to keep paddling. Man. It was, it, we were frequently... We were frequently making the same repetitions over and over and over and over again. 
It got to the point that I said, Jesus, please stand on the bow of this little canoe and speak. Peace be still. Let these winds cease. And it worked for a little bit longer. The wind was still on. I said, Jesus, I wasn't kidding. I was serious. And apparently he realized that some of us needed exercise yesterday because we had to continually roll down that Susquehanna River. It wasn't. We didn't roll one time and we were done. We had to continuously. It was a repetitious thing. That's what it means to be infused, to be, to be taught, to be impressed by frequent repetitions. Another definition of, of infused means to feel as with a certain quality. To feel as with a certain quality. In other words, to feel it to the maximum potential. To feel it all the way to the top. To feel it all the way to the brim. To feel it with great quality all the way to the max. How many of us want the maximum from God? How many of us want all that God has in store for us? How many of us have got our phones over our head and say, Lord, pour it out on me and let it come up inside of me. Let it begin to flow out of me. Let it overflow. Let me live in the overflow of what you infuse me with. But the last definition really got my attention. To infuse something means to introduce into the body through a vein for therapeutic purposes. To introduce into the body through a vein for therapeutic purposes or having a beneficial effect on the body or mind. I thought about people that go to the hospital that are sick in their body and they need to have some infusions of medication, infusions of minerals, infusions of vitamins, infusions of the good things that will come inside the body that will help the body recover and help the body benefit from what's being infused into it. And I'm going to tell you, just like a sick person that goes to a hospital that's in need of medication, it's my concern that the church is ill today and is in need of an infusion. That comes not from the world and not from the hospital and not from medication, but I believe we are in need of an infusion that comes from heaven. I believe that we are in the place and we are at the precipice. I believe that we are at the location and we are on the verge. And you know, when y'all say this one another, Brother Pastor Joe, you said this, you know, cup your hands like this and, and then release it to God and just hold your arms up and surrender. And I had to think of what I was going to preach on this morning. And there were times in my life that I would go to the local blood bank and they would want to take blood out of me. And you had to, you had to, you had to, you had to give them your arm, you had to surrender your arm to them and let them find a good vein to stick the needle in to draw the blood out. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You go there and they give you something to drink or give you something to eat and ask you a bunch of questions and they strap this rubber band around your arm, make you make a fist and jab you with a big sharp needle. They take the blood out of you and they use what we depart, what we give them to help somebody else in need. I want to tell you something this morning. Jesus, oh Lord, help me Jesus. Jesus Christ did the very same thing on the cross of Calvary. He allowed himself to be strung up on that cross and pierced on that cross so that the blood that was flowing through his body could flow out of his body and so it could be infused into the bride of Christ. He let the blood drip down his face and drip off his chin. He let the blood drip down his chest and drip off his toes. He let the blood flow down his back and fall off his heels because he knew there was coming a time and there was coming a day in the history of the church where the church would need an infusion and not an infusion from this world, but an infusion is from outside of this world, not an infusion that's just temporary, not an infusion that's just carnal, but an infusion that is eternal, an infusion that is spiritual, and I'm going to tell you this morning that I believe that we are in a place where the church of the living God is in a place where we need to be infused from everything that heaven has to offer unto us. Much like this little woman, she continually came to this judge, and she continually asked of him, it was a continual thing. She was infused with something that would not let her stop. She was infused with something that would not let her quit. She was infused with something that would not let her sit back and shut up. She was infused with something. And I believe she was infused with the very thing that you and I need to be infused with today. Here's my concern. I believe that the church today is being infused. But the question is this, is the church being infused with fear or is the church being infused with faith? Which one is making its way into the body of Christ today? 
Look around. I look around at myself and I see the, the surroundings around us and I see the environment in our, in our, in our culture and I see what's going on in society. And sometimes I, I'm cautious and, and, and sometimes I'm weary and sometimes I'm concerned that what's happening is that fear is being infused into the body of Christ. People are beginning to become so afraid of what's going on around them. This woman was not afraid to go to this unjust judge. This woman was not afraid to go knock on his door. This woman was not afraid to keep making the petition. This woman was not afraid of what the outcome may be. This woman had no fear in her, yet I'm living in a day, and you and I are living in a day, and you are watching me right now today, where it seems like that the church of the living God is being infused with more fear than anything else. Fear. Let me rewind this couple of months and go back to the middle part of 2019 when this virus showed up on the scene. Nobody knew what this virus was. Nobody knew what this virus would do. Nobody knew how this virus would interact with the physical body, what's going to take place. And so we were cautious at how we navigated through those first couple of months. We were cautious in our times together. We were cautious in how much we interacted with one another. We were cautious in what we touched that someone else had touched because we did not know what this virus was going to do. The more we learned about the virus, I believe the more fear began to be infused into society. And the more we learned about the virus, the more fear was being pumped in, not only to society, but I believe the more fear was being pumped into houses of worship. Fear. Got to be afraid. Don't let them touch you. Don't let them talk to you. Don't let them be close to you because you may get this virus, and this virus may cause you to get sick. And I'm not negating the fact that there's, the virus is not out there. I'm not negating the fact that the virus will get you ill. I realize that. I've been through it. So has Pastor Michelle and me of you have suffered through it as well. But I'm going to tell you something. If we understand who God is and if we understand what God has done when things like that happen in our life, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to challenge us this morning and I'm going to charge us from the Word of God this morning. When we don't understand, we need to not let society and the world infuse us with fear, but we need to understand that God knows what the outcome is going to be. God knows where the virus came from and God knows how to take care of it. But Lord, why are you allowing this and what is your purpose? Could it be that he's setting the platform for his church to rise to the surface to begin to, to send out the call of what it means to be a child of God in a dark and evil day? Amen. This virus, the effects of it, some got really sick, and we had several in here that really were sick, and we even had some that lost their life to the virus. I'm not negating the fact that the virus is not bad. I realize it's bad. But I'm going to tell us this one thing this morning, that if Daniel can face a den of deadly lions, Come on. if Daniel, who knew the kind of animals that were in that den, if Daniel did not back up in fear, If Daniel was not so gripped by fear that he refused to do what he knew he needed to do. No, the Bible says Daniel, after he knew the decree was signed, he got down on his knees, he opened up his window, and he kept on doing what he knew he needed to do in the face of fear. We face stuff that are bad. We face, face things that are, that are evil. Listen, I want to tell you something. If Daniel could face the den of lions, and if his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could face the fiery furnace, not bow down to a wicked image, and not give in to a wicked decree, if they, if they had that kind of faith and that kind of trust in the God that they served, then you and I need to have the same kind of faith and the same kind of trust in the same God that we serve today. Are we going to face difficulties? Absolutely. Is it going to be bad out there? You better believe it. Is it going to overcome us? It may or it may not. What God needs for us to do is we need to stand firm in our faith in Him and not succumb into the fear that the world is trying to inject into His body. We'd be cautious and we get startled. But he does not. He didn't give his son. Hear what I'm fixing to tell you this morning. You better lean in real good to this mechanism. Don't no, put it on your phone. Tattoo it in your eyeballs. Put it in your, in your brain as a deposit. He did not send his son to die for a church, for the church to operate in fear. He didn't do all of that so that you can I, so that you and I can look. 
look for a place to seclude ourselves when the first hard thing shows up. He didn't create us so that we could operate in a spirit of fear. He said, listen, you've not been given the spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind, Paul tells Timothy. It's time for the church to open her eyes. It's time for the church to open her ears. It's time for the church to open her heart. It's time for the church to open her mind and understand, like the sons of Issachar, understand the times that we are in. Because if we continue to allow the world around us to infuse us with fear, then what the enemy has done is he already has defeated what God has in store for you and I. But I'm going to tell you something. There is nothing so strong in this earth that, that will ever defeat or dethrone the God that you and I live. There is nothing that he can do, the enemy can do, that can ever stop the advancement of the kingdom of God. He may slow some down and he may get some to sit down, but God will have a ribbon on the earth. Y'all don't let me preach this morning. That's okay. God will have a remnant and the word of God will be proclaimed and there will be a church a bride of Christ that does not succumb to the fear but faces the fear and keeps moving forward in faith. Hello somebody. You on Facebook. Be careful what we allow to be infused into us. What is fear? Let me go quickly. What is fear? I've heard it said this way. You've heard it said this way before as well. False evidence of fear and real. Fear. False evidence appearing real. False. But it looks real. False. But it looks like it's a real thing. False. But it looks like it could possibly be, you know, I get tickled. The first time that Pastor Michelle and I ever made a trip up north, north of the Mason-Dixon line, was several, several years ago, decades ago now, we came to New York City with some church friends. We actually came to the Amish country. We stayed here and we drove into New York City. And I'm from the south, little town in the south, and all I knew about New York was its bags and big apple. There's muggers on every street corner. Sirens are always blaring. Cops are shooting people. People are shooting at cops. And so I was a little bit fearful going into the big apple the first time. We get in the big apple. We park the van. We get out. We find us a place to eat. I'm looking over my shoulder. Every step I take, I'm looking behind me to see who's trying to come behind me and do me harm. I'm looking down the alleyways. With all our, I've got pictures of what New York is like in my mind because that's all I've been exposed to because that's what's been impressed repetitively. Are you getting the picture this morning? We get to New York. And while, while I'm looking around and surveying the landscape for safety, Pastor Michelle is haggling with a street vendor <laughs> with some pocketbooks. Yes. That look real, but they were fake. They appeared real, but they were fake. They weren't real. False evidence appearing real. Not that the, per the person, not that they were causing fear, but just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. And so what happens is if you don't know the difference between what is true and what is not true, you may, you may trust something that looks the part, but is not the part at all. I'm looking for safety, she's having these fake pocketbooks. I'm trying to keep her from getting mugged and shot and stabbed and run over. She's having I'll give you $20 for it. You want $50, i will give you $20. I'm thinking, just pay, give me what he wants. Let's get off the streets, man. Sometimes that's what the adversary tries to do. He tries to cause things to appear real, but really they are fake, to create fear in us. To keep us isolated from the truth, to keep us held down or held back from what he really wants to happen here on the earth, what God wants to have happen on the earth. So my concern is that I believe sometimes the church is being induced or infused with fear. Rather, I believe that we should be infused with faith. F-A-I-T-H. We've heard it said this way, forsaking all, I trust him. Can I tell us this morning that they cannot coexist in the same vessel at the same time? You cannot have fear and faith operating in your life at the very same time. One is going to be more powerful than the other. You're either going to be afraid or you're going to be walking in faith. What are you allowing yourself to be infused with? Can I go a little deeper and tell you that fear... Is nothing more than a wedge that tries to separate you from God. 
Fear is a way that the enemy uses to try to separate you from God. Fear causes a person to sit in isolation. Fear causes a person to remain silent. Fear causes a person to rely on no one other than their self. Fear is the way that drives in for the vision of separation. What is faith? Faith drives you closer to God. I believe that Daniel in the lion's den was closer to God than Daniel was before he went into the den. I believe that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were closer to God in the fiery furnace than they were before they ever got thrown into the fiery furnace. Hello, somebody. I believe John the Beloved was closer to God when he was in the pot of boiling oil before they ever put him in the pot of boiling oil. I believe the disciples were closer to God when they were sown into, when they were crucified upside down, when they were beheaded and their lives were taken from them. I believe they were closer to God then than before they ever showed up. What am I saying? I believe that we are living in a day where faith is going to drive us closer to God. We're going to experience some bad stuff. We might experience some difficult stuff. We might experience some trying stuff. But if we will allow faith to draw us closer to God, we will get through those times and we will get through those occurrences and we will bring glory to His name. Because faith causes a person to gather with other people. Faith causes a person to, re to rejoice in the Lord. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name forever. Let us exalt his name together. Let us make much about Jesus. It might be difficult. Listen, I I'm, thinking about, I'm thinking about Paul and Silas in the jail cell. Uh, they have been beat up. They have been locked up. They have been locked down. They have been thrown into the inner parts of the dungeon. But the Bible says that about midnight, they began to sing and make praises unto God. Faith. Faith is what caused them to praise God. They rejoiced in the Lord. Faith will cause you to rely on Him. Faith will cause you to rely on Him. Because when he does things in your life, your faith is increased. When he does things in your existence, it causes your faith to become supercharged. And my prayer today is that the church is infused not with fear, but the church is infused with faith. My prayer is that when we come into the house of God, let the needle of heaven be injected into our spiritual body so that faith can flow from heaven. And if there was any fear, and if there was any doubt, and if there was any concern, and if there was any hardship and if there was any skepticism that as faith is infused into the body that fear is swept away just like when a sick person goes to the hospital to be infused with medication once the medication shows up the body begins to become healthy and the illness begins to be swept away my prayer is that whatever is aiming the church whatever is causing the church to be ill that when faith is infused the cause of the ill is being swept away that's my, my prayer over the church that we are infused with that kind of faith, that kind of belief in God, that kind of trust in God. What infuses us with faith? How does God infuse us with faith? How did this woman continually come to this judge and continuously ask him to get revenge for her, get vengeance for her? How would Jesus say the words in Luke 18, verse 8, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? When the Son of Man shows up, what is he going to see? Is he going to see a church that is filled with faith, or is he going to see a church that's been infused with fear? What is it going to be? I believe this. I believe God's truth will infuse us with fear. I believe the truth of God will cause faith to be infused into us. Listen to what Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2. He says, but avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. My goodness, that is about the time that we are alive today. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps would grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, being this, being, uh, having been taken captive by him to do his will. I believe that when we find ourselves experiencing the truth of God, the truth of God will infuse faith in our spiritual body. I believe that we expose ourselves to his truth. I believe it will cause our faith to be supercharged. Hello. Not my opinion, your opinion, but his truth. 
Not what she says they say or somebody else quotes, but the truth of his word. What does the Bible say? The Bible says you will know the truth and the truth will cause you to be in bondage. No, that's not what it says. It says you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Free people walk in faith. We don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. So if we're going to be, if we're going to have great faith, we're going to have to be, we're going to have to be infused with faith. And that's going to be the result of, of being exposed to God's truth. God's truth will infuse us with faith. God's light will infuse us with faith. We are living in a time of darkness on the earth. We are living in a time where there is great darkness and great depravity on the earth. But I want to tell you something. God's light will infuse us with faith. The light of the gospel will cause us to be infused with great faith. That when the darkness comes, it will not be able to overpower the light. It will not be able to cause the light to go out. But the light will cause the darkness to be dispelled. Y'all say it this morning. I believe God's light will infuse us with faith. Listen to what he tells the church in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. He says, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Whose minds the God of this age has blinded. In other words, what he's saying is that the, the outside world has made so much of an impact or an infusion into those in the church that their minds are already blinded. Their minds have already been turned off. They're veiled. They're perishing. Whose minds the God of this age has blinded. Who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Who is the image of God to shine on them? What is going on? The adversary wants to infuse so much faith because he realizes that if the light of the gospel is shined in their heart and shined in their life because it is in the image of God that they will believe what the scripture says. They will believe the gospel. So there are so many that have been infused with fear today and their brains have been shut off and they have not been exposed to the light of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus, or Christ Jesus the Lord. And ourselves are bond servants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It's the light of God that brings faith into your life. It's the light of God that brings faith into your being. It's the light of God that brings faith into your existence. The light that has shone into the darkness. The third point is this. Pastor Joe, come on up. You're on the team. I believe God's truth will infuse us with faith. I believe God's light will infuse us with faith. And I believe God's love will infuse us with faith. I believe the love of God will infuse us with great faith. How will the world know that you are a disciple of the Lord when you have love one for another? What does fear do? Fear causes hate. What does fear do? Fear causes dissension. What does fear do? Fear causes resentment. What does fear do? Fear causes bitterness. What does fear do? Fear causes, fear causes jealousy. What does fear do? Fear causes us not to love our neighbor as ourself. The greatest commandment of all. Love God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. And to love your neighbor as you love yourself. I believe God's love will infuse us with faith. He writes to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 3. He says these words. He says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you... Being rooted and grounded in love, may be to, able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height. To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. I believe His truth infuses us with faith. His light infuses us with faith and His love infuses us with this widow woman in Luke chapter 18, she had to have faith to be able to go back and keep asking, to be able to go back and keep petitioning, to be able to go back and keep requesting day after day after day after day to the point that the judge finally said, I've got to do something. She is wearing Let 
God challenge you today, church. When Christ comes, will he really find faith on the earth? When Christ shows up, where will your faith be? How strong will your faith be? What will be the result of your faith? My prayer for us today is that we find ourselves always faithful to the one who is always faithful to us. Can you say amen? I pray that we are like this little woman in Luke 18. I pray that we have the kind of faith that calls us to believe that even God can use something evil to bring something good. When God does it, the devil can't stop it. Hello? When God does it, the enemy can't stop it. When God does it, even all of hell can't shut it down. Because when God does it, it's going to be done. I believe that he's looking for a church. And I believe he's got a church. I believe he's growing a church. I believe he's maturing a church that has the kind of faith that won't give up, that won't give in, that won't sit down, that won't remain silent, that won't look for a closet to guard herself in, gather herself in, and shut the door and let the world pass her by. I believe that this is that church. And I believe that we are living in that time we have to be just like that woman in Luke 18 and 18. So that when Christ comes, he will find great faith on there. Can you say amen? Would you stand with me this morning? I want to do something for our school age kids today. And I know we didn't have children's shirts today. That may have kept some of our families away. And maybe you're home watching us with your children right there. I want you to gather them with you if you can. If you're a elementary kid in here or middle age, uh, middle, middle age, middle school kid, a high school kid, a college student, if you're a student of any shape, size, age, it doesn't matter. If you're a student, I want you to come and stand with this preacher across the front of this church. Come and stand. Let's make a line right here. And I want you to come and stand. I want you to look, look out in this beautiful congregation, your moms and dads. I want you to come stand right here. All of my, all of my school age kids, college, elementary age, it doesn't matter. Mom and Dad, you can come with them if they're a little shy. They'll come stand with you. Maybe, they'll, maybe they won't be shy if you come with them. Come on, son. You get up here with Daddy. Hudson's right there. Come on, stand with your brother. Come on, Cameron. Come on, Sam. Come on, let's go. Come on, Alana. I want you, I want you all to come on. You stand. I want you to look back at this congregation. Because you guys have to turn around and look that way. Come on, Alana. Come on. Come stand beside Sam. He won't bite you. I promise he won't. And we have more kids than this in, in church, of course, that are in school or starting school. And they, you may be watching this from home. Gather around your coffee tables. Now, the kids are up here. Now, if one of these kids belongs to you, if they're your child, your son, your daughter, your grandchild, I want you to come stand with them this morning. I want you to come take your, sta your, your station up here this morning. Say, so, preacher, what are we doing? Listen, these kids are going to one of the most uh, unsettling areas of our society, which are schools. Yes. Because of, I'm not going to bash public education because I've got one. You can tell by my language and my vocabulary. But there are so many things that are being taught and being brought up into the minds of these kids that if we don't cover them, they may find themselves in with something that does not need to be infused into them. Can somebody say amen? Nice. We have parents up here, grandparents up here alike. We do. All right. Now, church family, this is what I want you to do. I want you to stretch your hands this way toward these kids, toward these families. Because they're part of our church. They're part of this church. They are part of the bride of Christ. I want us to pray for these kids. Not only these that are here physically this morning, but pray for those that may be remotely at home with parents today, those that may be out, they may be traveling, they may be trying to enjoy the last little bit of vacation before school ever starts. But God, we're praying over our kids today. Our elementary kids, our middle school, our high school kids, our college students this morning. God, that you would so infuse them with your presence. That you would so infuse them with your goodness. That you would so infuse them with your faith. 
God, that whenever they have to go to those classrooms, when they step, step on those campus grounds, God, that they, they find themselves full of the goodness of who you are, full of all of heaven, so that they cannot be infused by the adversary's attack on them, on their mind, on their understanding, on, on their educational purpose, and on their educational uh, career. God, I pray this morning, Lord, that you so infuse them that they understand right from wrong. They understand what is from God and what is not of God. That they understand what is being spoken is true and what may be spoken that may be false. God, that they understand that comfort in that. And Master, may their parents and may their grandparents be able to stand with them and stand strong with them. God, that we would be like this little woman, that we would be able to represent the faith on the earth that you are looking for. And God, I pray for those classrooms that these kids go into. God, that those classrooms are surrounded by your spirit. That they, those classrooms are infused with your nearness. God, whether it's a public classroom or a private classroom, it does not matter. You can go anywhere you will. And God, we challenge you this morning, God, to make your way into those classrooms, to make your way into those schools, to make your way into those hallways, and keep those kids, keep our kids that are there, keep them safe and secure in who you are in their life and who they are with you. Guard them. Guard their eyes. God, guard their ears. Guard their mind. And guard their heart. Let them be completely infused with your faith. Let them be completely infused with your life, with your love, with your truth. Let them be completely saturated to the field, overflowing. God, let them be so infused that it will become beneficial to their bodies, but it will become a benefit into the classrooms that they're going to be going into. All for your glory. Master, be with this church today. Not only today, but in the days to come. God, that we continue to walk out the faith that you infuse us with. And may we continue to be a light shining in the darkness. May we continue to be hope dealers. God, may we, be, may we continue to be the word speakers. May we continue to be the truth sharers with those we come in contact with. And God, may your kingdom be exalted and may your son be magnified. And may your church be strengthened. And may your will be done on earth as it already has been done in heaven. Hold us in your hand. Love on us and allow us to love on you back and love on those around us. I ask it in the name of Jesus Christ and the church together shout it. I see the church together shout it. Come on, give God praise. One good hand clap of praise this morning. Hallelujah. Listen, you married couples, you married couples online that are watching this, don't forget. 5.30. 5.30 today, we're going to get together in the lower building. We're going to have our married couples class. It doesn't matter if you've been married for a year, 10 years, or 39 years. Let me encourage you to come out and join with us. If we don't see you tonight, we look forward to seeing you on Wednesday. May the peace of God surround you. May the grace of God empower you. May the strength of God go with you. And may you, may you be a reflection of Him in the name of Jesus. Until we see you then, peace. God bless you too.